Hi everybody and welcome to Cambridge City Christian Church's online worship service. I wanted to thank you for watching today and I don't know where you're watching from today but here at Cambridge City Christian Church's physical campus we have snow and lots of it and we thought you guys should see it so we're doing announcements out here. Um, I wanted to let you guys know to check out our bulletin. Our bulletin is available to view on the church's website at www.4c.church and it's also available on the church's app. You can download the church's app on the Google Play Store as well as the App Store. You'll also find My Response and Prayer cards there. You can fill out your My Response card to let us know you're here. And you can also fill out prayer cards. We pray in the office every Tuesday morning. So if you have any prayer requests, do that there. We are doing an Easter outreach event this year at Cambridge City Christian Church. Although we're not sure exactly what that's going to look like, we know we need candy. So if you would like to donate candy, donations can be brought to the church office anytime while we're open. It can be sent, if you want to send it through Amazon, you can have it delivered to the church at 106 West Church Street in Cambridge City. You can also make a monetary donation on all of our giving platforms you can specify that your giving is for candy I also I encourage you guys to check out our life group live with Danny and Travis our pastors and dive deep with me and Danny throughout the week we just talk a little bit more about the sermon from the past Sunday and Danny and Travis do their own series um, before we start the service today let's pray God, bless us as we meet together. Bless the singing of your praise, the reading of your word, the sharing of your fellowship, the prayers that will be heard, and bless us all as we meet together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, Shelby. And why don't you come back inside? Get warmed up a little bit. The rest of us, we can sing a song of praise to our God, all right? We praise you, O oh Lord, for the love that you give and the time that you spent on this world for our sin. We lift up your name in honor and praise. In Jesus, we place all our love and our faith. We know that you are our Savior, and we know that you are the Son, and we know that you you are the Savior of everyone. The time is now near when you will appear. When we see your face and your voice, we will hear. And then we will sing to Jesus the King, the maker, creator of everything. And we know that you are the Savior, and we know that you are the Son, and we know that you are the Savior of everyone, everyone, yeah. We praise you, O oh Lord, for the love that you give and the time that you spent on this world for our sins. We lift up your name in honor and praise. In Jesus, we place all our love and our faith. We know that you are our Savior, and we know that you are the Son. We know that you are the Savior of everyone, everyone, yeah. Oh, Hi everyone, this is Danny, and thank you for joining me for another message on the sun. We are now in week 13, 
and I'm so glad that you're joining me. This week, we are once again showing appreciation. If you're watching live today, we're showing appreciation to our staff members. Over the last couple of weeks, we've shown appreciation to our elders, to our ministry team leaders, and we have an amazing staff here at Cambridge City Christian Church. I'm so happy to be a part of our staff with uh, Shelby and Travis and Alan and Nancy and Debbie and Daria. We've just got, and Mike, we, we just have an amazing staff. And, and make sure you show your appreciation to them this week if you get a chance. I want to start off today's message by asking you this question. Have you ever chose something in the moment that you later regretted? <laughs> I, I bet we all have. And I'm sure that's exactly the feeling that a woman had one time when she had come home to find her husband cooking in the kitchen. While he was cooking, she noticed he was shaking frantically, and it looked like there was a wire that was running from his waist toward the electric kettle that he was cooking on. She thought he was being electrocuted, and so she tried to get him away from the deadly current by finding a piece of wood so she wouldn't get electrocuted too, and whacking him away from him. And when she whacked at his arm, she broke his arm in two places, only to find out moments later, when the regret popped in, that he wasn't being electrocuted, but that he was listening to music. His, her husband was listening to music on his phone. The wire is going to his ears. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> All of us live, regret, live with regrets, but there are just some regrets that are just hard to shake off. And it's because we usually choose, we usually choose good enough over better. I've talked about this before. We make financial decisions that feel good in the moment over what would be better for us in the long run. We make relationship decisions in the moment that often cost us later. And even at work, perhaps you've made a decision in the moment thinking it would be easier only to regret it later knowing that it was the wrong one. And see, when it comes to following Jesus, we often want to take the easy route. The one where we can get all of the good stuff of following Jesus, but without the hassle. We love to love Jesus, but when he teaches something to us that contradicts what the world thinks, well, we can be tempted to, be, to go silent, or maybe even tempted to just go along with the crowd. Jesus was not a person who went along with the crowd. He always went along with God, and so should we, because what God gives us, what he gives to us is, is always the best. So the question for us to kind of start thinking today as we jump into the word is, is that we all of us, all of us know we want what is better, but do we really know what it will cost us? In Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38, we can find <clears throat> that Jesus is up front with us about what it will cost us to follow him. Follow him. He's not going to lie to us or or tell us a flowery story. No, he wants us to know that it's going to cost us something. But before we find out what that cost is, I want to do a quick review. If you, if you go back into chapter 7, which is where we were last week, between that chapter and now, Jesus has continued to heal and feed thousands of people. with another, And he had another run-in with the Pharisees, like the one we talked about last time. But the passage before the one we're looking at today is a big one. Because in that passage, it ha there is a direct tie-in with what we're looking at today. Because in that passage, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. And this is huge. Because now Jesus means more to the disciples than just a miracle man and a teacher. See, this affirmation of Jesus is the Christ by Peter would also come with a heavy cost, which is where we're going to jump into today as I jump into the Word. So if you have your Bible app or if you have a good old print Bible like the one I have with me here today, I want to ask you to join with me there in Mark, <clears throat> in Mark chapter 8. And let's go ahead and let's read this together. Starting off and let's just stop. We'll look in verse 31 and we'll kind of stop there for a minute. It says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and re be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days, rise again. So what we see here is Jesus is laying out the terms of following him. He, it, it would not be what they thought it would be. They, they would be following someone who was going to be suffer, who would suffer and who would be rejected by the most um, influential of people. All of the leaders, the religious leaders, the civil leaders, they would all reject him. And in the, in, and in the end, Jesus, he would die. He would be killed. 
And in this moment, I'm sure as the disciples are listening, it dawns on them. You know, this, this alarm goes off in their heads. As we'll see here in a minute, it definitely goes off in Peter's head. Because they realize that if Jesus was going to die, if Jesus was going to be put on a cross, then there's probably a pretty good chance that if they follow Jesus closely, they might be joining him. <laughs> Reality check, right? <laughs> Reality check, because... They know that if they're following Jesus, Jesus ends up on the cross. He's an enemy of the state. He's the enemy of the religious authorities. They are going to be targeted next. Now, when I look at this passage, there is one word there in verse 31, the word suffer that really jumps out to me because the Greek term in the, this, for this word suffering, we usually think of suffering in a physical sense, but this word denotes suffering of all kinds. It's not just suffering physically, but it can even mean emotional suffering. And I wonder how many, how many of us, when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we confessed Christ, that, that we took into account that the one that we followed would be continually rejected and ridiculed by the most influential of people. Did you think of that when you accepted Christ? I mean, we shouldn't be surprised when the government and when media and when other popular voices in our culture speak out against Christ because it's always been that way. It was that way when Jesus was in the, on this earth, and it's still that way today. So even, even though we have, and what we have to remember is that our worth and our value is not given to us by the voices in our culture or by our government. Our, our value is given to us by Christ himself. That's where we find our comfort. So no matter, no matter what the world says about Jesus or says about us, we have to count that cost into following him and know that while we're unworthy to them, we are worthy to him because he's made us worthy on the cross. Well, in verse 32, Jesus spoke plainly about this. So he was, he was just right out there. He's not mixing words. He's not saying, well, you know. No, he's just being honest. And what happens in verse 32? It says, and Peter took him aside and began to what? To rebuke him. That's a strong word, isn't it? They he started to rebuke Jesus for saying these words. So evidently, Peter, he didn't like what Jesus had to say because it didn't fit the mold for what Peter had in mind about someone that he was going to follow. He wanted to follow someone that was popular, that was able to do miracles, that was going to remove the Roman authorities. He wanted someone that was going to fit his mold and probably, too, he didn't want to be put on a cross <laughs> like Jesus would eventually be, as we know. But I wonder myself sometimes. I look at Peter here and he's rebuking Jesus. But do I do that too? Do we take Jesus aside to rebuke him too? Now, obviously we don't do that literally. But, but are there things that he taught, commands that he has given to us, challenges that he has made to us, and what we do is we kind of take him to the side and, and we say, oh, well, Jesus, I don't know about that. I don't think that what you're saying there is right. That doesn't fit what I think or what the culture or what the narrative in, in the world around me thinks. So we kind of take him to the side and we kind of rebuke him. See, commitment to Christ is oftentimes made on our own terms. And if we're following Christ on our own terms, we're not following Christ. Now in verse 33, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, so after Peter had just rebuked him, he turns and looks at the other disciples that were there around, and what does he say? He says perhaps some of the most strong words that he ever says in his ministry, and especially directed toward the disciples. He says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but you have in mind the things of men. What a, what a stern moment that Jesus has here with his disciples. You know, oftentimes, the very people that are the closest to us can, can take us and pull us away from Jesus. Now, they might have good intentions, you may think, but but they're often their intentions, and that's what's happening with Peter. Peter was trying to pull Jesus away from his truth, and Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples, closest friends. And Jesus stood up to him and said, no, you're not going to take me away from the ways of God. For us, this, this is also a warning for us about arguing with God's Word. Don't we do that sometimes? We kind of argue with God's Word. We say, I don't know about that, God. I don't know if that, that word quite fit, that what you're saying there quite fits. When we argue with God's Word, we may not realize this, 
But what we're doing is we're opening ourselves to ideas that oppose God's word. When we're arguing with it and trying to twist it and turn it so that it makes us maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about something, we are not really um, holding to the word. We are making the word say what we want it to say. See, Peter thought that he was protecting Jesus by rebuking him in that moment and saying, hey, no, 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 this isn't what you're going to do. That's going to lead to a, to a bad place. We're gonna, let's go a different route. You need to have a different plan, Jesus. <laughs> but the fact is, is that anything that we do that takes us away from the plans of God is a dangerous path. It's a dangerous path for eternity, and it's the worst thing that we can do for ourselves and others. Now, in verse 34, he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. One of the most famous words, some of the most famous words that Jesus said in his ministry. See, he wanted everyone in the crowd that day, not just his disciples. He wanted everyone to know the terms of what it would take to be committed to him. He wanted them to know the cost, and it would deny it would, it would mean denying oneself and putting him first, putting God first. And yes, it would involve pain and suffering. It would involve hurt. But it's all about following Jesus, about rejecting the sinful nature and reflecting more and more the beauty and the grace and the truth of Christ. Now in verse 35, he goes on to say, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So again, Jesus, he's very clear here where we have to stand. Commitment is about losing our lives for the kingdom. Now, it could mean our lives physically. It could mean physically. But, but most likely, it's usually going to mean giving our lives figuratively. The way that we think, the things that we do with our hands and feet, our heart, our time. Each and every day, we have to surrender our will to the will of the kingdom. Now, what we've seen here with this is that Sacrifice is always a byproduct of commitment. When we follow Jesus, we, we have to understand that gaining a Savior can often mean losing things in life. Sometimes it can mean losing friends, it can mean losing possessions, and perhaps even losing one's life. When Jesus asks us to follow him, he is honest and he is upfront with us, as we've just seen. Will we choose the short-term losses for eternal gain? And if we don't, then have we really gained Jesus? Following Jesus requires a total life reset when you decided to follow him, whenever that was. It requires a change of mind and, and how you look at things. It requires a, a change of your heart and how you feel about things. It requires a change in your priorities from that of focusing on yourself to instead focusing on him and his kingdom focusing on others. There's probably nothing harder than to accept in our lives, to, nothing harder to accept in our lives than when we follow Jesus, than it is to sacrifice all that has seemed important to us for the one who is the most important. Are you willing to do that? See, the point today is this. Don't give up what you want most for what you want now. Don't, don't give up what you want most for what you want now. See, sacrifice surrenders comfort now for the comfort that we want most. We live in a culture that is surrounded by comfort. We want warm homes. We have entertainment options galore. We want the comfort of possessions that seem to make life easier. But is it possible that we are so focused on the now that we are losing what and who is most important in it all? See, the writer of Hebrews gives us a wonderful description. He gives us this great description of what our earliest brothers and sisters in Christ endured because they had their mind on bigger things, not just what was going on around them. He writes in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 34 this, he said, you sympathized with those in prison 
and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Now, how were they able to do that? How were they able to give up what they, everything that they had, and, and even be jailed because they knew what was still to come? I think each of you, I think you want, more, you want Jesus more than anything. You want the comfort of his peace, the comfort of his joy and forgiveness. But will, take, will you take it really knowing and really accepting the terms of following him? Will you know that it will cost you? See, sacrifice surrenders what one has now for what lasts forever. One of the problems with living within time like we do and then desiring comfort is that our sinful nature often leads that into a drive that settles for what we can get now instead of what could be better later. Um, we see it. We see it as less and we we see it in our lives less and less when when people uh, when they think of their finances, they're not thinking about the future. They're thinking of it now. We see it when a child gets some money and uses it on something small when they could hold on to it just a little longer and add to it. They could get something better if they held on. See, we are we we are in this instant gratification generation, multiple generations. And as Christians, I think the same, the same concept holds true for us, too. Randy Alcorn, one of my favorite authors, he wrote a novel some time back about persecution of Christians in China that was entitled Safely Home. And in this, he had a dedication at the beginning of the book that said, To Graham Staines, who left his home in Australia to serve lepers in India for 34 years. To Philip Staines, age 10, and Timothy Staines, whose age was 6, who at half past midnight on January 23rd, 1999, as their father held his arms around them, were burned to death by a mob in India. Here's a picture of them. They were murdered because of whom they knew and who they served. He went on to write in the dedication to Gladys Staines, who continues to minister to lepers and who said to all of India, I am not bitter or angry. I have one great desire that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gave his life for their sins. He writes even more in his dedication to Esther Staines, Graham and Gladys' daughter, who was then age 13, who said, I praise the Lord that he found my father worthy to die for him. Wow. What powerful words. Sacrifice surrenders the path you want for the path that lasts. From a young age, we are instilled with the idea that we should strive to accomplish our dreams. And, and while the path to those dreams are sometimes direct, and, in, and sometimes the path of those dreams meander around for a little bit, don't they? The idea, of, um, the idea of doing something we desire seems to be the one that comes naturally. But should it? Now, I'm not here to be a dream wrecker. I believe in the power of doing amazing things and, and having dreams, but as Christians, we must frame what a dream is. Is a dream something that's born out of a desire to get ahead, to be successful and make lots of money? Or are our dreams based on what God wants for us? I wrestled with this whole question of dreams when I was in high school a lot. When I entered my junior year in high school, I narrowed down what I wanted to do when I graduated. I would either be a pastor or a pilot. <laughs> Those were the two things that I narrowed it down to. I would either fly people around or help people fly away. <laughs> I, was, I really was leaning toward being a pilot, but when I attended a youth conference um, that I attended, I was challenged to ask myself if this is really what God wanted. And being a pilot was not what he wanted for me. And so here I am, and I'm so glad that that's what he decided for me. And I've had to sacrifice a lot for that. I'm a thousand miles away from my family, and it can be really hard sometimes. It can be really lonely. Standing for the truth of God's word in the culture that we're in is not always easy. But that path that God has laid out for me is the one that will last. What are you doing in life right now that is important? Is it the path that God wants for you? 
Is your work, is your fun, is your education, is it leading you closer to Christ, leading to His glory? Your dreams, they can be good, but God's plans are always better. In Philippians 3.8, it says, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Well, a little bit later, I'm going to rejoin you, and we're going to discover, some, we're going to discover together something that there are some things we can do to ensure that we are choosing what we want most over what we want now. What do we want most? We want to live for God's kingdom. How do we know that we're doing that? Doing that? Join me in just a little bit, and we'll find out. Thank you for joining me in this time of communion and today I want to read a passage it comes from Romans chapter um, chapter 8 verses 31 to 39 here's what it says it says what then shall we say in response to this if God is for us who can be against us who he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give give us all things who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen it is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Is it Christ Jesus who died? No, it's more than that. He was raised from, to life. And, and Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no... In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I go back to the very beginning of this passage that I just shared with you here during our communion time, there's something that really jumped out at me. It got me to be thinking about how we cheer for sports teams. Now, I don't know if you are into sports, if you have a team that you cheer for. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But, but something that always cracks me up with supporters of different teams is that they usually support their team in two different ways. First, they support their team directly, but they also support their team by, by then cheering against the other team. <laughs> I see this a lot. I'm a big soccer uh, follower, and you see this a lot. When you're cheering for your team, but then you want another team to lose so that it helps your team, we see a little bit of that going on in sports even here in America. And, and, it, and it just got me to be thinking when I'm looking in this passage, because it says here that if God is for us, who can be against us? God is there cheering for us, and it doesn't matter who it is in our lives that are cheering against us. God always wins. God always comes through. And how did this happen? How are we able to achieve this kind of support? It wasn't by anything that we did. It was by everything that Jesus did for us on the cross. And so here during our time of communion, I want to encourage you to, to really savor and enjoy that you are on God's team and that God is cheering for you all the way through all the ups and all the downs. He never gives up on, on us and he never forsakes us no matter what comes our way. And so let's be grateful for that this morning. Let's take a few moments in quiet uh, thought and meditation, and then we will uh, partake of the emblems either uh, in our imagination or we can do it if you have something there at home with you. So let's be silent here for just a few moments. Father in heaven, we come today and we're just so grateful that you are for us. While it can seem like this world is against us and, and there can even be people that are directly against us because of our faith, Father, we know that, that we will win because you support us. You are our biggest fans. Even though we are imperfect and broken and we bring that here 
in moments like these as we partake of communion, Father, we know that it's through your Son and what he has done that has made us a part of the team. And so, Father, we thank you for what he's done. We thank you for your love. We thank you for always being there to back us up. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here for the next few, uh, as you're going to take communion or whatever it might be, um, it, the first thing we do is we take the bread. And let's think of the bread. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then later Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood, which has been shed for the forgiveness of sins. Well, before I leave you, just one other reminder. Don't forget about how important it is for us to give with our offering. Every week we, we want to really mention this because it's important for our ministry here as, our, as, a, as a church and here in our community. I know many of you watching online maybe even in places all around, maybe even the world. But remember, it takes our giving, it takes your support in order for all of this to happen. And so I want to ask you to do that, and you can do that in a variety of ways. You can send it to our church through the mail or drop it by our mailbox at 106 West Church Street in Cambridge City. You can give online at www.4c.church. There's a link at the top of the page uh, where you can, you can give. Um, you can also do so through the church app. Um, you can just download our Cambridge City Christian Church Church, church app on the Apple, uh, Apple um, App Store or the Google Play Store, and there's a link at the bottom of, of the main page where you can give as well, or you can give by text. So there, there's just a variety of ways to give, and let's continue to support the work of the Lord, and also remember that everything we have is really His anyway. Um, to give back to Him is an act of of uh, spiritual discipline. It's important for us to give, and I want to encourage you uh, to, 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 do, to do that. Well, may the Lord bless you, and let's move on here with the rest of our service today.
praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, you only. Great are you, Lord. So earlier, Jesus shared with us the cost of commitment, that unlike the world that wants glory without suffering, that following him would actually lead to suffering that would then result in glory. See the difference? But this is really hard, isn't it? <laughs> really hard, because no one wants to suffer. Everyone wants to be accepted. So we often, what do we do? We make the mistake of taking what is easy now in exchange and to the exclusion of something that would be far better later. So again, remember, the point that, that we're focusing on today from the Word is this. Here it is again, just as a reminder. Don't give up what you want most for what you want now. Don't give up what you want most for what you want now. So, <laughs> so what can we do? What do we do to ensure that we don't give up what we want the most for what we want now. What can we do to make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, let's take a look at that here for just a few moments with this challenge. The challenge is, is to develop an eternal perspective. Develop an eternal perspective. Remember, your life should not ever be measured in years. Now, we often do with our birthdays, right? But, but we should measure our years in the scope of eternity. And so the first thing you can do to help develop an eternal perspective is to be honest with yourself. The first step toward finding an eternal perspective is being honest with yourself and with God right now and, and being honest that you're not, that you don't have an eternal perspective. And I want you to know you're not alone. Most of us are so wrapped up in what life throws at us that we are just trying to fight through the day, much less <laughs> focus on eternity. But I want to encourage you to take a hard look at yourself and then look at where your perspective has to change proactively determine uh, what your priorities are that's the next thing you can do to have an eternal perspective proactively determine what your priorities are often our priorities have been given to us or forced upon us well what do I mean because of your life situation you have made things and you've made things important because well they are they are important if you're a parent Raising your kids, that's a priority. Work, that's a priority. School, that's a priority. But when was the last time you took time to really try to determine what is important to you? To really look at what's important. And does it have an eternal perspective? When we deliberately determine what is important to us, not something that's forced on us, but we actually think of what's important to us, then if we do that, it's easier to practice what's often called delayed gratification. 
See, if this little thing then gets in the way of the bigger thing, because we're so focused on the eternal perspective, that little thing will not keep us away from what is better and the best thing. But see, what so often happens is what can happen to the founder of Ray Kroc. I don't know if you've probably heard of Ray Kroc. Here's what he used to say. He used to say that the three most important things in his life were God, his family, and McDonald's. But then it didn't end there, though. He would also then go on to say, but that when he got to the office, the order was reversed. It was McDonald's and then family and then God. Don't let that happen to you. The third thing I want to encourage you is to have people in your life who are focused on eternity. Don't expect to focus on the big picture when you're close to and receiving advice from those whose focus is only on the now. I mean, are you actively engaged with others who have a different perspective, or do they have a biblical, eternal perspective? I think it could start with a life group. We talk a lot in our church about a life group. And finding people who are filled with the love of Jesus, there's, there's just something refreshing about connecting with people who see time differently than what the world does. Because what it does is it reinforces your faith and helps you walk with confidence. Get in a life group if you're not in one. We have them online. We have them in person. Contact our office. We'll get you connected. Because see, knowing the cost that Jesus talked about, knowing the cost helps you appreciate the reward. The best things in life often do not come easy. And the best thing that you have in this life and in eternity didn't come easy as well. Jesus gave his life on a cross to change your perspective and to change your eternity. And the more that we learn about Jesus and the cost that he paid, the more that we appreciate what we've been given. See, to him, the cost he paid was so worth the reward for you and me. Praise God for that. We, we are so fortunate that he loves us like that. It's so true. You know what? It's not going to always be easy to follow Jesus. It's not going to be easy to, to really follow him and to be like him. Sometimes people will not understand you. Other times people will not agree with you. But standing with Christ and being committed is totally worth the cost. And with that cost, when you leave this world, you will be in heaven and you will say that it was so, so worth it. And all the while, while you pay a cost, I want you to know right now in this world that Jesus is fighting for you. There's a story one time on a hot summer day in South Florida. There was a little boy who decided that he would go for a swim in the old swimming hole behind his house. In a hurry to dive into the cool water, he ran out the back door <laughs> leaving behind his shoes and socks and shirt. He just wanted to get in the water, and he went out the door, and he jumped in, and he flew into the water, not realizing that as he swam toward the middle of the lake, there was an alligator swimming toward the shore. Well, his mom in the house, was she was looking out the window and saw the young boy running out to the water and jumping in, and as soon as she saw this, she saw that this gator was coming across and getting closer and closer to her son. And in utter fear, she ran toward the water, yelling to her son as loudly as she could. And hearing her voice, the little boy became alarmed and scared. And, and he made a U-turn and he started to swim back toward his mother, but it was just too late. Just as he got to her, the alligator reached him too. And so from the dock, the mother grabbed her little boy by the arms, just as the alligator had snatched the young boy's legs. And they began this incredible tug of war between the two. And the alligator obviously was much stronger than the mom. But this mom, <laughs> she was so passionate about her son, she was not going to let go. Well, thankfully, a farmer happened to drive by, and he heard her screaming, and he raced from his truck, and he took aim with his gun that he had in his truck, and he shot the alligator dead. Well, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, this little boy, he survived. Now, his legs were extremely scarred by the vicious attack of the animal. And on his arms were deep scratches from where his mom's fingernails had dug into his flesh in her effort to hang on to her son, who she loved. The newspaper reporter who interviewed the boy after the trauma asked him if, if he would show him his scars. And the little boy, he lifted up his pant legs. And, and then with 
obvious pride in his face and in his voice. He said to the reporter, he said, but look at my arms. I have great scars on my arms too. And I have them because my mom wouldn't let go. And see, just like a mother who loves her child, so God loves you. The scars on his hand and his feet, the hands and feet of Jesus remind us that God in his great love for us, that he would not let us go. I want you to know today that the cost is so worth the reward. So let's hold on firmly and tightly to him, no matter what comes, and know that following him is so, so worth it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for for your bluntness, for your frankness with us, that Jesus told us that it wouldn't be easy to follow you. I'm so grateful that you were honest in laying out the terms of following you. But Father, we, we know that it's not going to be easy. And, and it starts with a battle of in, inside of us where we often want to fight against you and your word because we want to do what we want to do. Father, help us to let you win that battle, that you would overcome us and that we would be more like you. And Father, we know that the battle can also come from outside. Father, we are being confronted with ideas, with, with um, half-truths that are all around us and that are seeking to um, destroy our faith. And, and Father, there is a, a persecuting essence to that as we watch these things. God, it's not easy. But Father, help us to stand true because we know that your word will last. The ideas that are around today, the perspectives that are around today, they will change. A hundred years from now, they'll be totally different. But Father, your truth remains the same. And so Father, help us to find comfort in your truth. Father, I pray for your people, both those watching and those uh, watching online and even maybe watching later, Father, that, that they would hear your truth, that they would know that there is a cost of being committed to you, but that we would jump in full throttle without any hindrances, not holding back, that we would not be afraid to follow you because we know that the cost is so worth being your child. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the blessing of your truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for joining me today as we've continued the series on the sun, and I look forward to seeing you next time as we continue our series. Take care. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a 
Christ. 